my presentation. Very good. And give me a moment here while I join the session and make sure. OK, very good. So I think you can see my um, slides. So I'm just going to go ahead and begin. OK. So um, first of all, thanks to everyone who's here. I'm excited to be talking with you today about designing and building great web APIs. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is me. This is how you find me on Twitter and GitHub and LinkedIn and uh, all sorts of other platforms. I'd love to connect with you, hear more from you and what you're working on. So please uh, feel free to uh, connect with me. If you connect with me in LinkedIn, please remind me that it's that we're meeting through the interface event and I'll be sure to recognize you. So the material for this session is actually based on this book that is going to be released in July, Design and Build Great Web APIs with Pragmatic Publishing. And it's really a collection of all the things I've learned over the years from many, many people. And um, I'm going to try to just give you a, a little sense of what that's like uh, today, give you a, a sense of what's in the book. It's just sort of a high-level view. But if you're interested, you can find more there. So what I really want to talk about are these ideas of foundations for building great web APIs. What's a great web API? What is the foundational piece? Uh, and the practice of design, build, and release. Design, build, and release. Design, build, and release. That's our sort of cycle of what we're going to do. And I'm going to share with you patterns and practices that I found really common. And then in typical sort of Steve Jobs fashion, there's a little extra thing at the end. All right. So let's get right to the foundations side of things. So foundations are what help us actually put everything together. What is our purpose? What is our reason for doing all these things? So first, the first foundational element uh, I like to talk about is API first. So I, I learned about this from Cass Thomas in 2009, this idea of, of designing uh, uh, I, means identifying key actors and people and what is it they're trying to do with APIs. APIs are here to solve a problem, solve a business problem, to solve a group's problem, to solve an individual's problem. And that's what we really need to do. When you think API first, what you're really thinking about is first, what is the problem and how can I help solve it? Uh, Ken Lane has a great way of thinking about API first as sort of the foundational element or the platform piece that we all start with. I like that too. Um, but I love Cass Thomas's point of view. We're solving business problems. We're designing APIs for people, not for generics, right? Not for robots, but for people. People need help. If people are writing in C Sharp or PHP or Ruby, these are different people. They, they think of things differently. The API I construct for a JavaScript developer is different than the API I construct for a Rust developer. And that's really important to think about. And that means I need to design for an audience. And I will need to do design thinking. I need to plan out what is this person? What is, what is their day like? What do they do every day? What is the challenge that's facing them? And how can I help them? So that's really what API First is about. Um, the other thing that in the foundational element is this notion of uh, HTTP, the web, and REST. This book is unapologetically about HTTP APIs. Now, we've had a lot of HTTP APIs for a quarter century. That's a long time. We won't have them forever. We've got lots of other things going on that sort of challenges that HTTP space. But because of the scope of the book, I stuck with HTTP. It's important to think that, remember that HTTP is a protocol. It's a standardized protocol that everybody uses. There's nothing creative here. There's nothing magical going on. It's just how we do things, right? That's how we pass information around. The web is another story. The web is a common set of practices, separation of concerns between the markup and the script and the, and the layout and uh, uh, you know, styling. Uh, the idea of using links to get from A to B, using forms to collect information, to describe what I need to collect, to collect it and pass it on. That's a common practice model. Now, that's, the web is a common practice. It's not a set of standards, but there are lots of interlocking behaviors that go into place. And last is this idea of rest as a style. I'm, I'm very much a rest type person. I really like the notion of rest. It's a 20-year-old uh, dissertation, so there are lots of other things besides rest in the world. But I still focus a lot on REST. And REST has this really interesting approach that there are properties of a system that I want. So I'm going to set up some requirements and some constraints to get those properties. We don't talk about it here today, but there's, there's a, a section in the book that talks about what REST is really about. REST is about eliciting uh, properties from a system that you don't control. How do I get a group of people to act in the same way? How do I herd cats? That's what REST style is about. 
So um, we really have this idea of solving business problems, solving for people, and using this pattern of which protocol I'm using, what practices I'm using, and what style I'm eliciting. You can plug in other things. If I want to use UDP, if I want to use TCP IP, if I want to use WebSockets, that's a protocol. What are the practices I'm going to use? I'm going to use web practices. Am I going to use uh, internal software practices? What is the style I'm going to use? And so on and so forth. All these things come into play. So those are good foundations. Once we have this notion of foundations, what are, my, what are my basic principles? Now we can start thinking about designing and talking about designing in a really uh, coherent kind of way. So I want to talk about designing from three perspectives, modeling, designing, and then describing. So modeling is collecting up all this information so that it makes sense. Designing is actually acting on what you've, you've put together. Describing is documenting it well. So when we model design, what we're really modeling is interactions in life, right? Uh, there's a thing called uh, Donald Norman, Donald Norman's action life cycle. And you can see the illustration here in the slide. So Donald Norman's action life cycle is this notion of we have this world, we have, we have a goal. We want to see what we're trying to do, and we want to execute a plan, specify, perform, see how we change the world, interpret those changes, compare it to our goal, and decide if we need to go again. There are no straight lines. It's a circle. Too many times I see people design software as like we're going to start from A and go to B. That's not how it works. There's lots and lots of circles, attempts. And that means there's an API story. We need to know when we're modeling. We need to end up with something like an API story. Here's an example of a simple API story. What's the purpose of this service or this API? What is the data that we deal with? What are the actions that people want to commit to it? What are some of the internal processing or rules that we have? Purpose, data, action, processing. This is the key to writing a great API story. You don't have to worry about screens. You don't have to worry about things like that. But you need to figure out what are the actions people want to do. We will use this as part of our design process. And usually there are lots and lots of stories that you need to collect up, just like you would in user stories. Designing is another thing. Taking all of that information we've collected about your purpose, your data, your actions, and any internal processing or rules, and now start thinking about your design. We need to think, well, how do people normally do this? How are they doing this in real life today? Do we do skeuomorphic design? In other words, do we just mimic what they do online? Uh, we mimic in person and do it online? Or do we completely design it differently? Maybe people need a change in life. Maybe people need it the same. Think about your design. What are the jobs to be done? I need to get certain things done. I need to get this action taken, this action taken, this action taken. Where are the bottlenecks? What am I really trying to do? And then literally diagramming that in some kind of way. Actually create a physical diagram. A lot of people uh, take information in uh, through a diagram much faster than they do in writing. So using a diagram is key. Now you'll see the, the actual illustration here are several steps in this whole design process. I need to get the description, that's the story. I need to create a diagram for people to use. I need to find, uh, write down the definitional details of the actual definition of what I'm gonna do, like the blueprint. And then I actually need to write a document, uh, write documentation that makes it possible for other people to use this in some way. The more complex, the more confusing, um, the more difficult it is to use the object, the more documentation I need to have. Don't wanna write a lot of documentation? Make it super easy to use, right? Okay, so here's an example of a diagram. I use a kind of a weird looking diagram. It's not really quite a, it's not a state diagram. It's not really quite a sequence diagram, but it has this notions of activities I need to do, like list and filter and read and update and delete, and connections between the two. I can go from the home uh, uh, action to do a list action. I can do from the list action the filter action or a read action or maybe a delete action, or maybe a create action, right? So I have all these connections, and I label the connections in between because they'll come in handy later. It doesn't really matter what kind of diagram you use, whether it's UML or any other kind of complex diagram or action diagrams or, or anything. As long as you're consistent and you have a visual diagram that your audience can use. It's really important to diagram what's going on in a way. Notice again in this one, there are no straight lines. I don't go from one step to the other. I actually go from home to list, and then I go from list to a bunch of things, and maybe I go from read to a couple of things. This is really, really important to think about. This is our cycle of execution that we talked about earlier. 
Finally, I need to describe my design, all this model information that I took, I need to describe it in a technology agnostic kind of way. I don't know exactly what people are gonna do with this design when they're done. They may build a uh, open API, uh, they may build a GraphQL API, and they may build an async API, or use protobuf, or even a WSDL, or something else like that. I don't know yet, but what I need to do is capture all of that. So I need to capture all the details and properties and actions in a way that's gonna allow someone to then design, build the last, build the design in the way they need. I use a language called ALPS for this, the Application Level Profile Semantics. Uh, this is a version of ALPS uh, that's written in the, um, uh, there, there are very, many sort of XML, JSON, and this is a sort of the YAML version. ALPS are really simple descriptors. We don't need to get too excited about that. You can look in the book and you can look online. Actually, I point out there's a little tool that converts ALPS documents into these other formats. So I can read in ALPS and output an open API, read in ALPS, output a GraphQL uh, uh, setup, a read in ALPS async, protobuf, so on and so forth. So what I wanna do is come up with a machine readable way that lets, uh, that's technology agnostic, and that's what the ALPS document is for. The ALPS is really the robot or the machine version of the story, right? So I wrote down the story, the data, the actions, uh, and all of that stuff. Now I convert it into something a machine reads. That's what this is. So model using your story, design using a diagram, describe using something like Alps or some other description. Some people skip Alps and go right to the type, like they'll go to RAML or OpenAPI. It's fine if you wanna do that. But I encourage you to come up with a technology agnostic version that lets you actually launch several different types of designs. So once we're there, now it's time to actually build something. Now it's time to actually put something together. And I would like to talk about sketching, prototyping, and building as the three steps of, of creating uh, APIs, making them real. So I'll talk about sketching from Frank Geary. I actually learned this from Ronnie Mitra. Ronnie's given a talk here uh, at this event as well. Sketching lets you literally write out, let's, let's, what, is the, what does the front end look like? What does the API look like? What does the, what does the exchange look like? What does the query look like? I use apiary blueprint language to do my sketches. So I write up simple sketches, I can press F5, I write them in Markdown, press F5, and I can test them. I can test them with a mock. So I can do sketches in minutes. I don't have to take weeks or days. I can do sketches in minutes. Sketches are meant to be thrown away. I'm just gonna sketch the things that are interesting to me. Prototyping is different. Uh, prototyping is complex, it can be expensive, and needs to be very detailed. I need to explore a lot of details. This is actually the prototype for uh, the Mount Rushmore in the United States. Uh, there's lots of stories about how much Mount Rushmore got built. It's actually a very much a lean story. So if you'd like to learn more about that, I, I encourage you to do that. But I use Open API. Prototypes are, for, uh, are meant to be tested out. So I'll write a rather detailed Open API and use that mock for all those kinds of details. I'll figure out exactly what I need to do, what are the responses, what are the bodies that I need to pass, what are the queries, what are the uh, uh, head, what are the uh, tags, headers, all sorts of things like that. Finally, once I have, I know I've explored options, and I know I've got details, I can actually start building. What you wanna do is you wanna make build of an API boring. I've already done everything, I've already discovered all the details. Build is simply assembly things. Think about a construction site. I don't wanna dig a big hole and order a lot of cement or a lot of girders until I know how this is gonna turn out ahead of time. So I'll use a repeatable process. What I use in the book is a, is a, is a library system called Dart for isolating the data, the actions, the, the resources, representations, and transitions. We'll talk briefly about that, but again, it doesn't matter if you use some other format. What, what matters is that you can do this consistently and repeatedly. So I describe all of the data that we pass on the interface, any required elements, any enumerated values for data types, any default values for data types. I then actually write the code for the internal actions. This is how you approve payload, update a customer, set the status, uh, so on and so forth. I write that code directly. Then I marry that code and those interface requirements with a set of resource routes, right? So you can see I'm using, uh, I'm using uh, Express here. I think Express is just really easy. It's super easy to use, so I use it. Now, I also need to uh, talk about the representations out. So I always convert my internal model into a message model. Message models are the strong typing of the web, whether it's uh, something like HAL or Uber or Mason or Collection JSON or Siren or things like that or HTML. 
or CSS. These are the strong types, not objects. That's not how the web works. They, they work on these representations. And then finally, I add another thing that, that is important to me because I use the REST style, and that is a way to express actions in HTTP language. So this is how you add an account. This is the URL you use. This is the rel tags. This is the title. This is the method. These are the arguments, and so on and so forth. And you can get a lot of things done with that. So sketch to experiment. Toss away the things you don't need. Prototype. Um, so while sketching takes me minutes, maybe prototyping takes me days, building will take me weeks right, in some setup. And I want to make sure that what I'm doing in building is translating that design into something that's solid that works in a repeatable kind of way. So let's talk about releasing APIs here. So I put in my book, releasing is testing, security, and deployment. Now in reality, you'll be, remember, no straight lines, you'll be actually doing this over and over and over again. You'll be testing every time you save, you'll be working on security all the time, you'll be deploying over and over, maybe every day if you're lucky, right? But here we're gonna talk about them separately. So when I talk about testing, remember we're testing the interface, not the code. We're testing the behavior, the inside out. That's why I like BDD so much, right? Because BDD is, is from the outside in. Be sure to test both happy paths, which you expect to return 200, and sad paths, which return 400s. I shouldn't be able to save a record if it's missing a field. I shouldn't be able to write a field with an invalid value. I shouldn't be able to approve this if the record's missing something uh, uh, from some other action. Right, so I got to test both the happy and the sad. I use a thing called simple request testing, which is literally using curl. I write up a bunch of curl messages into a small script, and I can run that in one step just like that. I can run SRTs in milliseconds, right? So very often that's my proof um, for build before I do a build or a check-in. I use Postman and Newman for full-on BDD testing, right? So I use Postman to write my my tests, write my uh, scripts, and I do a thing called um, uh, protocol structure values when I write tests. Test the protocol. Did I get a 200 or a 201 that I should have gotten, or did I get something else? And did I get the right media type, the right strong type messaging? Are there other headers that I need to focus on? Uh, then I can do uh, structure. Does it have certain pieces to the puzzle? Does it have a body? Does it have a, a link section? Does it have a data section? So on and so forth. Then I can check the values. Does it have a link that has the value of X? Does it have a name that has a value of X? And so on and so forth. So that's really, really important. I also we talk about some uh, libraries that I use, but we'll talk about those later. From the security side, I keep it real simple in my APIs. I focus on uh, encryption, identity, and access control. Encryption is just basically your HTTPS, your, your TLS system. For uh, uh, identity and access control for machine-to-machine -machine authorization, I use Java Web Tokens, and, um, and I use Auth0 as my provider. So I keep it super simple. It's rather fiddly to do authorization uh, because you really have to get a token ahead of time when you're doing APIs. You can't do it interactively very easily. But get it, get it ahead of time, and you'll be fine. That's kind of what this does. So request a token and return a token from the OAuth provider. Then I carry that with me. Then I request a resource, I carry that token. That token gets validated by the service, and then I eventually get this thing sent back to me, right? There's more talk about that. Deployment's also a, an interesting challenge. I have organizations that do lots of kinds of deployment, whether it's integration, delivery, or, or just basically continuous deployment. So it's really important to know the difference between the three. Continuous in integration is when I do all my coding, check-in, and testing over and over again, continuously. Uh, continuous delivery is when I can do automatically post something to staging, and then maybe once it's approved, somebody can go ahead and put it in production. Continuous deployment is when I can actually go all the way to production. Remember, automation improves safety. Automation makes things more consistent and makes them safer. I use, uh, in the book, I just use Heroku via Git push. I love Git deploy. Git deploy is a fantastic notion. It it's lowers the, the barrier of entry and repeats so many other things. So I use a little bit of script, and if things fail, then everything gets moved back automatically because that's really what needs to happen. Heroku's really good at doing this. Other organizations are good at doing this as well. I just happen to use Heroku in the book because it's, a, it's an easy start. Okay, so test your interface and behavior using Newman and Postman. Test your security uh, using uh, client credentials with, with tokens. And uh, automate your deployment using something like Git push or something else. So we've talked about uh, the key elements we have a foundation, we do design, we do build, release. What's the last thing? You're gonna to have to modify this API. 
you're going to modify it over and over and over. So we need to have some principles. We need to have some ideas about, remember when you write updates, first do no harm. You're not supposed to break anything. You can't break anything. You need to know when to say no. It's, it's too dangerous to make this change or it's okay to do this change. You can fork your API and create a new one if you want. Uh, remember, when you design things, you can't take anything away. You can't change the meanings of things. All you can do is add. Adding is how it works. It's how it works in nature, how it works in any complex system. You need to test all of your new releases using all the old tests. Don't rewrite your tests. You can write more tests, add tests for the new feature. Don't rewrite the old tests. You need those old tests to confirm that your new component still works the way it should. When you release, you need to make sure that you support reversibility or reentry. In other words, reversible, we can reverse this change just like Heroku does. That's the first thing you need to do. Second, you need to favor the idea of side-by-side -side releases. I can have edition one and edition two side-by-side -side running at the same time. It doesn't really matter. People can use the one they want. If you do an overriding release, if you actually get rid of the old code or get rid of the old interface and you're going to use another one instead, make sure it's backwards compatible. Otherwise, you're running a huge risk. In real life, we don't have overriding releases in nature. We just have more divergence, more variance, and some die off eventually. That's the way it really works. And that die off eventually is really important. When it's time to shut your API down, it's going to be at some point it's already solved its problem. Nobody needs it anymore. It's not profitable. It's outdated. Place the code in the public domain so others can still use it. If you can't do that, at least open source the interface. Everyone's been using the interface anyway. Place it in a repository somewhere so somebody can create their own if they still really need the service. Allow people to recover their data if you've been keeping their data. Allow them to have their own data back. And then mark your existing production API for 10 gone with a pointer to where the new version is or where the documentation is or where the public domain code is or where the interface is. API shutdown is really important. You're going to do a lot of it. If you create a lot of APIs, you're going to do a lot of shutdowns. So pay attention to this really important element in the story. First, do no harm. No breaking changes. Test using all the old tests. Favor side-by-side -side release. And be responsible when you shut things down. That's a whole other book. That's a whole other process. So foundations, design principles, building principles, releasing patterns, and this idea of updating. That's how you design and build great web APIs. It's a never ending cycle, just like we talked before, because we all we're really doing is identifying what people really want, what they really need, and what they want to do with their APIs. And that's our job. So hopefully, I know that was a whirlwind, but hopefully that makes some sense. Do we still have some time for a few questions? Yeah, I think, uh, I think okay. we have the time for one question that I've been collecting already. And so okay. how, you know, how will you deal with this never-ending challenge of uh, the design on one side and then developers opting to write the code first and yeah. they don't want to hear but, anything about it? Yeah, so the most common, uh, the, the thing I tell people most often is those people who want to write code first, get them on the design process. Don't, 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 I know it's hard, but get them involved earlier. Get them involved in the process. I'm, I'm working with a customer right now that their their, their culture is a real hard a big challenge with that. But the idea is to is to rather than <clears throat> you know fight that urge, take advantage of that urge. Come into the meeting. Help me write the story. Help me do the sketches. Help me do all of these things on the early side. And then what happens is people will learn from both. It can be a challenge. It's not easy. But then again, you know what? If it was really easy, they wouldn't hire us at all. They just have machines. So get people involved. If people are not comfortable, the best the best idea is to get them to join you. Yeah, sounds reasonable to me. All right, uh, you can give your virtual round of applause to Mike. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for being here with us today. And uh, we're gonna be moving with the next speaker very soon. So you can stop sharing your screen and uh, okay, and, uh, disconnect. But be with us. Uh, stop sharing my screen somewhere. Here we go. There you go. Okay, and then you can, yeah, Thank you. You can leave the channel. I'm going to be hanging around for the next few sessions. I'm really excited about this. Thank you very much for having me. No problem. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, can you, you go? can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. So um, 
let me introduce Arnold very quickly. So he's the author of the design of every day, every day's API. He's yet another of our uh, very seasoned speakers, has been speaking to multiple API this event. And in particular, he's going to be talking about um, you know, how you can um, do a better API design review using some of the toolings that are open source in the space, in particular using Spectral, which, by the way, is authored by the people at Stoplight. That's the company I work for. I also wrote part of the Spectral intern by myself. So I'm very, very looking forward to see what the people are doing with the tooling we do. And so a uh, round of applause for Arnold and uh, take it away. OK, so just trying to share my screen. Yes. I think I have to quit uh, Chrome for a few seconds. I'm back in uh, 15 seconds. Okay. Well, I guess I, uh, I don't, I don't have any joke ready. Um, but I guess um, on the well, I, I can probably do a commentary on the problem of the code versus the design, and so. I think this is probably one of the things that you should. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. You good? Uh, I hope so. So let's try again. Try to, yeah, try to share the screen again. Sharing the screen. So okay. uh, yeah. I will yeah. now try to launch my keynote slide deck. Okay. It seems to work. Yeah, okay, so now I'm going Great. to leaving and take it away. Let's go. So, hello, everyone, again. So, um, as you know, I'm Arnaud Roy, the author of The Design of Web APIs, which was a uh, long time ago called The Design of Everyday APIs. Uh, you may also know me as the uh, API handyman. I'm a senior APR architect at Natixis, a French group providing banking and financial services. And my job is basically helping IT and business people understand and create APIs. Helping people to create APIs implies reviewing API design. And API design review is a vast topic covering many aspects from um, pure design concerns to cross-team governance and everything in between. So if you want to learn more about the overall topic, you should look at my APIs and review or starter set. Uh, it's a talk that you can find on my blog. Today, I will focus on my journey to what I call the uh, augmented API design reviewer, which aims to make reviews more efficient, safer, and simpler. I tell you why and how I automate part of API design review using the uh, open API specification and spectral, a YAML and JSON blend type. Uh, when people want to create uh, a new API or modify an existing one, its design must be reviewed. Uh, to do a review, I meet the API team. They explain me what they want to do so we can discuss about their needs and the send me their design. I analyze it in depth. Uh, we discuss my feedback, the fix the design, and if needed, we cycle. An API design review has three purposes. First, ensuring that the identified needs are the real ones and ensuring that the design actually fulfills those needs and also possible future ones. Second, ensuring that the design offers a good developer experience, that it is easy to understand, easy to use, and does not unduly expose implementation dates. Third and last purpose, ensuring that the design has the same look and feel as all of our other APIs, and so making our APIs even more user-friendly. And this is done by checking it conforms to our API design guidelines. That sounds like a good plan, so what's the problem with API design reviews? Checking conformance to guidelines means checking that each property name is in lower comment case. Checking that schema names does not end with technical suffix such as DTO or VO. Uh, checking Russell's path structure, tracking non-evolvable array of strings, among dozens of other checks. Checking conformance of a small new API or a small modification is done easily in a matter of minutes. But when there are dozens of them, 
minutes become hours. And there is a significant risk of oversight because I'm just an average human being with a limited amount of concentration. And things get even worse when working on huge APIs. Hours can become days, and the question is not, will there be oversights when checking guidelines conformance, but how many? The problem with API in design review is actually succeeding to avoid oversight and spend the less possible time on guidelines conformance dub checks. And on the other side, spend as much time as possible on tasks actually requiring a human brain, like working on the needs on developer experience. And how do you do that? By augmented API design reviewers. Hopefully, we don't have to become machines or cyborgs to uh, be faster and more accurate APIs and reviewers. All that is needed is a machine-readable API description and um, a small program called Linter. So forget wiki pages and other spreadsheets. Use the Open API specification to describe your APIs. The Open API specification, formerly known as the Swagger specification, is standard and programming language agnostic REST API description format. An Open API document can be either in JSON or in YAML format. It describes API resources, path, operations, response bodies, and any other thing you need. To describe data, the, API, the Open API specification relies on JSON schema, which allows to tell, for example, that uh, a user is an object composed of required ID, first name, and last name, and an optional address property, which type is defined by another JSON schema. Now that we have the machine-readable uh, description of an API, we can analyze it with a linter. Instead of reinventing the wheel, I use Stoplight Spectral, which is an open source linter that can analyze data such as uh, open, uh, uh, open API documents, async API documents, Kubernetes configuration files, or any other uh, JSON or YAML data. Linting an open API file with a uh, spectral uh, command line interface or CLI is quite simple. Open a terminal, type spectral lint, followed by the open uh, API file name. Spectral is able to uh, detect problems right out of the box without providing any other information than the API description file. Uh, for each problem, you get its location, uh, its level, the rules that detect the problem, and a human-friendly description of the problem. All this works right out of the box because Spectral comes with a pretty fine rule set specially uh, made to analyze open API documents. Obviously, your guidelines are probably not the same as the ones bundled in Spectral. And hopefully, you can design your own rule sets in order to check that an API design conforms to your guidelines. A Spectral rule set is a YAML file. Uh, it contains a rules properties. And inside this rules property, uh, you will get uh, different rules, each one identified by the name. A basic rule is composed of three elements. The given property, which is a JSON path, indicating where in the document this rule will be applied. Uh, the current value we see here uh, targets the ID property of any reusable schema inside an open API document. The then property describes the controls to be done. Here, the control is applied on the field type of the element, which is found by the given JSON path. It consists in checking the field type value belongs to an enumeration uh, composed of a single value string. The enumeration function is uh, not the only available function. Uh, Spectral obviously comes with some others you can see here. And last but not least, um, the uh, last property of a basic spectral rule, uh, the description that explains what is happening. And so we say, OK, uh, all ID properties must be of type string. So let's now rerun uh, Spectral again with our, uh, with our rule set. It tells us that on line 28 of the Open API file, there is an ID which is not of type string. And indeed, in the reusable user schema you see on the, on the right, uh, we see that the ID property is of type integer and not string. 
when I did my first test, I was uh, totally blown and totally convinced that Spectral was a must-have to secure and speed up my reviews. Using Spectral looks quite simple, but let's now talk about uh, about the real world, beyond the hello world. Let's talk about how I actually build and then use spectral rule sets. It would take a day-long workshop to describe all the functions, tips, and tricks I use to build uh, my spectral rule sets. As I don't have a day for this session, I will focus on the two most important matters that uh, may not obviously come to our mind when uh, using such tools. I will focus on how to design rule sets and how to be sure they actually work. But still, while talking about these two topics, I may incidentally share some tips, but without going deep into details. I wrote a post series on my blog to share everything, so stay tuned. So, just like an API, a spectral rule sets actually need to be designed. You, you can just start from scratch and write random rules without uh, thinking about what you do. You need, you need to have a plan. If you don't already have API design guidelines, write them, at least a minimal version, version that you will expand when needed. Uh, look at my Lord of API Designs talk uh, to, to learn more about that. Once that's done, you can start to express your guidelines as spectral rules. But do not rush blindly. Just like when you represent uh, jobs to be done as a REST API, you have to think twice. You must ensure that your design is relevant, user-friendly, and maintainable. To do so, you obviously have to think about rule names and descriptions, but choosing adapted rule granularity, severity, and organization is even more essential. Let's talk about granularity first. If our guidelines tell that all responses are objects and not string or arrays, for example. And that a get slash whatever slash plural name always return a list of resources. And this list is represented as an object containing a required property named items, which is a list, a list of resources. And each item uh, in this list must be an object and not a string or a number. And when the response is a list, the return object may contain some information about pagination, like the current page and the total number of page. To check all that with Spectral, we could create a single rule named Valid Collection Schema, telling that a list response must conform to our guidelines with a very long but explicit description of what is expected. This rule would target schema in 200 responses of get operation on path ending by plural null, thanks some magic regex filter. And eventually, in the then clause, we could use the schema function that checks a data structure conforms to a given JSON schema. And so, we provide this function, the JSON schema of the expected JSON schema of the response. I wish I could have hours to explain that, but it's really important. Uh, so what happens if we run Spectral with a rule set containing this rule on this open API file having a get slash users returning an array of user? Spectral detects the problem, but what is the problem exactly? Is there a mistake on the pagination data or something else like items uh, which are not object? We don't know. Maybe customizing the message to add the problems path and error message may give us more clue about the problem. Okay, so as we can see, the user schema as a problem, object should have required property properties. If you're not uh, an expert of your guidelines, your spectral rule, JSON schema, and the open API specification, this means absolutely nothing. This rule is definitely too coarse grain. Let's split up in four smaller ones, uh, each one checking an individual aspect of what we have described earlier. Now that's better. We know exactly what the problem is. We know that our response list is not an object and it's not encapsulated. We know what, how to fix that. In my examples, we only have seen warnings, but a spectral rule can have different severities. Here's how I use them. An error, that's an actual error. It must be fixed without any discussion, like two or four no content returning data. Warning, it looks like an error, but it can be normal, fix it if needed. 
for example, a post request body without any required properties is not normal most of the time, but it can be normal sometimes. Info. Possible improvement. For example, hey, what about adding pagination or filters uh, on get slash whatever slash plural name, which is supposed to return a list? Hint. That's an element that needs to be discussed by the API design reviewer and the API team. For example, the use of content type other than application JSON, like application PDF, that may require specific design and implementation because files shouldn't go through our API gateway. That way, and especially using the int level, I know where I have to focus my investigations and discussions. And finally, in order to be user-friendly, but most importantly, be maintainable, you have to organize your rules in various full set, just like you would organize a function in various libraries. Currently, I have 71 spectral rules organized in 10 different rule sets. Rules are organized based on what they test. Each rule set can be used individually. For example, if, if I want to check something like, uh, does each operation is covered by at least, at, by at least one or of two scope? I will use my security rule set. But if I want to use all my rule set, I have a main rule set you see here that includes all of our rule sets, thanks to the extends uh, property, which is a list of paths to other, to other local or remote rule sets. So, as you can see, you can end with many rule sets containing many rules, some of them being quite simple, but some of them can be terribly complex. How to be sure that all of these actually work? By doing tests, as usual. Here's the summary of the various test strategy I used during my journey while I, I was learning Spectral. So at the very, the, the very beginning, sorry, I had a single rule set. I created a single desktop and API file to check that all my rules were actually working. So I launched Textual with my rule set and this test file, and I manually check uh, that I get uh, every error I expect. Obviously, it became a clear nightmare because it was really hard to add new use cases into the uh, open API files and to manually check Spectral output because I had too many rules. Splitting my rule set in smaller ones was not only dictated by the need of organizing them, uh, it was also done in order to simplify my testing. So instead of having a single rule set and a single test file, I had many rule sets and many uh, test files, one for each rule set. But it was still painful in the end to add new test case and especially to manually check the results. Hopefully, Spectral is also uh, available as uh, not just library. Therefore, I created Mocha uh, unit test suites and used the spectral library in them. I created one test file, one for each rule set, still using an open API file for each one, but now I programmatically check that I get the expected problems. It's far better. I at last realized that some of my rules were actually not working at all. But even if it was better, using a single open API test file for each rule set and so testing all rules inside the rule set at once was too complex and prone to errors. That's why I got a level deeper in my testing strategy. I decided to test each rule in isolation with a dedicated input for each test. To do that, I tinkered with the results of a spectral parser to only keep a specific rule active and deactivate all the others when running a test. I also managed to be able to use partial open API documents instead of complete ones, making writing tests easier. As the number of rules and rule sets were growing, um, I was fearing to forget testing some of them. So I had it checks to ensure that I have a test suite for each rule set. And at the end of each test suite, I check that each rule has been used at least once. This is not perfect, but it works so far. And as my testing became more and more accurate, I realized that some rules were not working at all because uh, the JSON path in my given clause were totally missing their targets, missing some of their targets, or hitting the wrong targets. 
So I got another level deeper. And instead of testing each rule as a whole, I did delegated tests for, uh, for the given clause. To do those tests, I tinkered again inside the result of the spectral parser to retrieve the given JSON path of each rule. And then I used the JSON path plus uh, node library, which is used by spectral under the hood. Uh, uh, so I use uh, this library on some JSON input to check that what is returned by each JSON path is actually what is expected. The level of the given clause testing depends on the JSON path complexity. If there is no filters, like the first one, uh, I just take that I get what I expect on a simple example. But if there are filters, like the second one with uh, regex, for example, I check that I get what is expected, but I also check that I don't get what is supposed to be ignored. After all these evolutions, writing tests for my rule sets became quite simple. The test with name tells my uh, spectral wrapper uh, which will set to load. The sublevel test suite tells the spectral wrapper which rule should be activated. And then for each test, I usually four checks uh, based on fragments of uh, open API documents. I check that uh, the JSON path actually find what I need. I check that the JSON path actually ignore what I want to be ignored. And I check that the rule returns errors when I need them. And I, I, I check that the rule returns no error when I don't need them. And the final check consists in verifying that all rules have been tested. I have no more than 400 tests to check my 71 uh, rules. That makes me confident, and so I don't need to double check what has been checked by spectral rule sets. And icing on the cake, I can design new rules very quickly and very shortly. Let's sum up what we have seen about the design of spectral rule sets. Create your guidelines in the first place. Ensure user friendliness and maintainability by choosing adapted vulnerability, severity, and organization. And on top of that, do not forget to test your rules like you would test code. Once you have a minimal rule set, you can start to use it immediately. Do not wait to cover uh, your rule guidelines. Using Spectral in your design and review process as soon as possible will help you to improve your rules design and also your spectral skills. It may also give you a few ideas about how to use spectral in your, in your review process, and that happened to me. Uh, so when I do API design reviews, I use spectral in three different ways. The first one is very obvious. When I receive an API contract for review, I use the CLI to do a quick check and see how many problems there are. If I need to go quickly, uh, uh, through whole programs, jump from one source to another, I open the file in Stoplight Studio. It's a GUI with both open API and spectral supports, and I also use it when designing APIs, but that's another story. To make my rules available in Studio, I just need to add a .spectral.yaml file in the project. And uh, it's a regular rule set, and I reference my rule set targeting directly my Git repository. And so the problem list you see on the bottom right uh, show the problems detected by my rule set. I just have to click on each problem to directly go to its source. But all this only works when there are not many problems. If there are hundreds of errors, and that happens when I do a full review of a very old API, uh, the outputs of the CLI and the rendering in Studio is not really usable for me. I need to, uh, to have another view of, uh, of the different categories to get started, uh, to do filters in order to make a summarized, re a summarized review that will be the input uh, of a design workshop. Hopefully, the CLI can output the result as JSON, and I pipe that into JQ, a command line JSON processor that allows to do crazy stuff like transforming spectral JSON into a CSV file that I can import into a spreadsheet, yes, a spreadsheet. If you want to learn more about GQ, check my blog, there's a post series about it. So I import the data into a good old spreadsheet and I can easily sort, filter, and get all the stats I need and prepare my workshop. This session was quite intense and all this was only a brief summary of how I use Spectral. I use it now on all my reviews, it really helps me to make I run out.
Yeah, I can see your screen now. So I'm going to be logging off and leave the stage to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Rackley, and I'm a VP of Core Innovation at Capital One, where I'm responsible for the creation of modern cloud native core banking platforms. In 2016, I wrote a book with several co authors about microservice architecture. It seems like enough people seem to have liked it that I'm actually currently writing a second book uh, with my co author, Ronnie Mitra, and that book will be published later this year in November. Uh, today, I would like to share with you a design process for APIs and microservices that I have been working on the bits and pieces of over the course of last decade. I have successfully implemented various versions of it uh, at different companies where I have worked. I've actually uh, taught it at the university as part of the distributed computing course. And uh, it is also described in much more detail in that microservices up and running book that I mentioned. So in this design system, uh, the one that I'm going to share with you, it's a top-down multi-step methodology and a collection of reusable processes, where each later step evolves from a previous one. Due to its evolutionary nature, we call the system uh, seven essential evolutions of design for services, or much more short term, we call it SEEDS. This tongue-in-cheek name is actually quite fitting because um, the analysis performed with this methodology often proved to be the essential seeds, no pun intended, from which a beautiful complex microservices and API driven systems can emerge. It all starts with identifying the actors, the participants of the interactions we're trying to model with the APIs or services. Main motivator for starting modeling with the definition of actors is to aid in scoping and prioritization. The typical plague of API and service design in our industry is over abstraction and lack of clarity regarding user needs. Too many APIs are simply exposures of some database tables over HTTP or an attempt to provide direct networked access into application internals, let's say with gRPC. Such lazy and uh, I would say naive approach to service design is seldom successful. And that should not be surprising if we don't even bother to ask who will be using this API and what are their needs, or can we possibly design solutions that solve for the needs of this people? So, uh, on the screen, you're seeing a, a kind of an imaginary uh, fake, completely fake uh, application. So we're going to be using throughout this presentation to explain the seven-step design process. And uh, the premise of this application is, let's imagine that it's some kind of uh, digital coin exchange wallet application. How would we design API for it? So in this application, some of the actors you could identify are, let's say, Digicoin customer. Uh, it could be a Digicoin wallet, and it could be the Digicoin, the actual application that somebody is using. So once we understand the actors, we should understand their needs. Uh, here we assert that APIs are products. So there were a whole bunch of presentations in this conference where people talked about how APIs are products, we, and we really believe in that, so we want to embrace it. So if we assert that APIs are products, then their design can benefit from product design best practices. Right? So one of those is Professor Clayton Christensen's uh, Jobs to be Done framework, in which Professor Christensen claims that customers find products useful mostly because they have specific jobs to be done. And the products that they employ assist them in getting those jobs done. Therefore, useful products emerge when we understand customers' jobs to be done. So if we uh, likewise want to design useful APIs, we should probably understand the jobs that they afford to get done, those APIs uh, afford to get done to its users. Uh, to make the whole design process repeatable, we capture jobs to be done that we learn usually from customer interviews in a standard format, right? So from 
one API design to the other API design. We want this to be a repeatable process. So we use a standard format, specifically a jobs to be done a story template that was created by Paul Adams. And there's a link uh, at the bottom of the slide if you want to read more about that uh, in the blog post about the template. But generally, uh, in this template, we very importantly identify the circumstance of the job, the motivation, and the goal. And the template itself goes like, when circumstance, I want to motivation, so I can go. So let's look at some examples to understand this approach. So some of the jobs to be done um, in this template for the DigiCoin application could be when a customer wants to buy coins. So the context is the customer wants to buy coins. They want to see current price of a coin. So the motivation is to see current price of a coin. And so that they can estimate their buying power. So the goal is to estimate the buying power. The motivation is to see the price of the coin. Likewise, another job to be done could be when a customer initiates coin purchase, they need to add or reuse a payment method so that they can provide funds for their purchase. Right? And you may notice a lot of people do uh, some kind of agile methodology these days. You may notice these stories are quite similar to Scrum stories. But it's important to notice the difference, right? In a Scrum story, it starts with a persona. So as a somebody, I do something. In a jobs to be done uh, template and in a jobs to be done theory in general, the circumstance is much more important than a persona, right? So we identify the actors so we can then find the jobs. But once we're describing the jobs, it's the circumstance under which we're trying to get this job done that is much more important than the persona. So there are differences between jobs to be done template and the Scrum story. Okay, so after we go through that exercise, through that step, we're going to have a list of jobs to be done. And that's really great. That takes us really far in understanding what we're designing. However, in complex situations, um, interactions in the world are too sophisticated, usually, to describe a model with a simple list of jobs to be done. We usually need to design an interaction diagram. We need to understand the interactions. Uh, and these interactions explain the sequence of events between various actors in the system. Uh, in the spirit of reusing existing methodologies, you can design this interaction any way you want, but because we already have a very powerful tool to describing interactions, I usually use UML sequence diagrams for designing that. Uh, more importantly, on the screenshot, you see that uh, you can design a UML diagram using uh, a text, uh, which is something I really enjoy. I can never design the sequence diagrams in, the, in any graphic editor. But there is a, a language called a plant UML. There are others, but I, I use usually plant UML. And using plant UML, uh, you can textually uh, describe interactions, which is very convenient because then I can also collaborate, right? As, as far as my source code is text, uh, I can share, I can commit it to GitHub, I can share it with my collaborators, and they can um, create pull requests to it. So in that very collaborative way, we can work on a sequence diagram, and then I can visualize it. The variety of tools, there are many tools that I can visualize at plant UML source. Um, the one that I like a lot is this thing called liveuml.com, which is used uh, to uh, render the uh, rendering that you see on your screen. It's a free web-based application. You, should, you can also install it locally. And uh, that's how we go about understanding the sequences involved in an API interaction uh, most of the time. So once we have that, so now we have the jobs to uh, be done and we have the sequence diagram, we understand a lot about what we're trying to design. But um, the job stories provide great format for conversations with your customers, right? Uh, with the subject and another experts, but they're not actually very useful for designing or deriving technical um, uh, design. They're a little bit more on the business side. Therefore, what we do after we have the interactions and we have the uh, jobs to be done, we recommend translating them in what I call the queries and actions for the APIs, which is what the fourth step of the SEEDS process is all about. It's all about identifying queries and actions. So what are queries and actions? Uh, queries are lookups um, with defined inputs and outputs. 
it should be a well understood contract between the client and the server what input is client sending and what response they expect. Queries, are, and the way that queries are different from actions, queries do not modify the system. There are no side effects, right? It's just the question I ask with a known input and an expected output. Actions, on the other hand, are requests to cause some sort of state modification in the system. They do have side effects. Uh, they also have well-defined contract in the sense that they have an input, and usually you do define expected uh, outcome of an action. So let's look at some examples of queries um, in Digicoins and the same Digicoins application. So one query based on the jobs to be done and interactions we showed could be look up a coin price. So the input of that could be a digital coin identification, so kind of like the currency identifier, and the traditional currency code. So let's say I want to know how many Bitcoins or what portion of the Bitcoin I can uh, buy with US dollars, right? So that US dollars and the Bitcoin would be the input, and the response would be the current conversion rate. Uh, another uh, query I could have in the system is a lookup of existing payment methods, right? At some point, I will have to pay for a Bitcoin. It's, which is not really a thing anymore, not many people do that, but if you're into that kind of thing and you are really buying Bitcoins, then you need some way to pay for it. So the system, the wallet needs to look up uh, the payment methods and uh, it would require something like user identifier, payment type, uh, and the response would be uh, possibly some kind of unique identifier and the details of the payment. Uh, let's look at an example of an action. So an example of an action could be actually charge a payment method to fund my coin purchase, right? So now that I have really decided I do have to, I do need to buy this coin, this way I can uh, buy a coin by providing a payment method identifier amount and the currency. And the expected outcome is going to be the money will actually be withdrawn from my credit card or the debit card or whatever I use for this purpose. So that's queries and actions. So uh, we'll identify the list of actions and queries bring, uh, bring you very close to achieving the goal of designing effective APIs and services, but they do not usually contain enough detail for actual implementation. In the next step of the SIS process, you should take actions and queries and produce a proper standard documentation standard spec for an API. You can use whatever format you want for the uh, API spec, but uh, I personally, a lot of times use for RESTful APIs, I use open API specification. You can use RAML or something else, but as long as it's a standard specification in which uh, you can describe in great detail your API design, that's what this next step is about. Taking actions and queries that already give you a lot of information of what you're trying to design and now translating that into some kind of standard specification. Like I said, the open API specification um, is great for RESTful APIs. Uh, it is technology agnostic, right? It doesn't matter what you end up then uh, implementing this API scene, whether it's like C Sharp or Golang or Node.js or whatever it is. Uh, you will still be able to describe your API in a standard way. For non-RESTful APIs, because those are not the only APIs, you can use other more fitting um, approaches, right? So for, for instance, if you're designing a GraphQL API, you'll probably use GraphQL specification to describe it. The initial version of the API and service design, as captured by some standard specification, let's say open API specification description, is an important milestone, right? Uh, once you have that, you're very close to saying, I kind of have my API design. But there is more modeling work that is necessary for a well-designed API, not just a designed API, but for a well-designed API. And this is true because unfortunately, most teams rush into implementation before they get a chance to receive any external feedback on their designs. Right? So they have thought about it, they, they have talked to the customers, they have maybe understood the requirements, and now they are eager to code and they rush into the coding. 
but it's still too early to code. Because what we need to do is before we spend all of that time and money in turning our design into code, we should probably show somebody our design and get some feedback. Coding without uh, getting feedback, coding without proving our designs by an independent third party developer, most uh, uh, the best is to talk to people who will be using your API, or at least to talk to people who usually use APIs who are more like client developers. You definitely want to talk to mobile developers because they usually have a, a specific take that uh, some other developers don't. Um, if you don't do that, then it will lead to significant amount of waste. It will lead to subpar designs. If you're building an API that you really care about the design of, its design is not done until you receive significant feedback from outside developers. As a matter of fact, we used to say that a design of the API is not done until somebody tries to implement a client that conforms to its API design. But at the very least, you should um, be getting some feedback before you get into the coding. So that is the penultimate step of designing your APIs, seeking the feedback on your design. And only once you are done with all of those steps, should you sit down and start thinking about what databases do I use to implement this, what languages do I use, only then you should start actually implementing your APIs. So that's what the seven essential evolutions of design for services or the SEEDS methodology is. It's an evolutionary process that allows you to design repeatedly and consistently various APIs and various microservices. It's a methodology that, may, that brings a lot of predictability, a lot of repeatability in your process, and in our experience leads to really well-designed services, better designed services than uh, if you are not using any methodology. Thank you very much. This is all I had to share today, and I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I enjoyed giving it. Vincenzo? I was uh, clicking the button. So okay. thank you very much. You've been very dutiful with the time. We're in perfect time. We don't have any question for you at the moment. So, but everybody can reach you out um, in private or even in the channel in case you wanna you wanna chat with the people. Uh, so you can now stop sharing your screen and leave the room. And um, I'll be welcoming the next guest. So the next one on the list is Ido Gino. He is the founder and the CEO of Rapid API. And his topic is going to be basically to understand what will be the best API style according to the needs of your application. So we're going to be waiting a couple of minutes for he just joined. How are you, Ida? Good, good. How are you doing? Yeah. All right. Uh, I already made a good presentation of you, so I'm going to be leaving the stage and uh, take it away. Yeah, we'll do. And just trying to figure out the screen sharing in here. There we go. Um, yeah, so hoping you can actually see my screen now. Awesome. So just going to move quickly. Uh, um, so hey, everybody, nice to formally, um, uh, nice to formally be here. Um, just a second, sorry. Um, Vincenzo, can you actually see the right screen for this presentation? Yeah, I can see your slides on the right and your face on the left, so you're good. Cool, awesome. Yeah, sorry, just trying to make sure that uh, everything is in order. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, as uh, you greatly introduced, my name is Ida. I'm the CEO and founder of Rapid API. Um, I'm going to give this brief conversation today about uh, different types of APIs and formats of APIs, uh, and then understanding how, how they are similar, how they differ, um, and what's the right approach for choosing the right one. Uh, in terms of trying to build an overall framework for how to manage uh, the architecture when you actually end up having multiple of these API types. Um, and just to give uh, some brief background about the company that I'm part of, uh, so we're Rapid API. We're actually the world's largest API marketplace, so serving uh, well over a million developers around the world, helping them discover and connect to over 10,000 APIs. 
Uh, and then on top of that, we also powered, and I'll uh, speak a bit to that uh, towards the end of the, uh, of the talk today, uh, we power a lot of internal API stores uh, for larger companies that realize they have a lot of different APIs um, and a lot of different types of APIs laying around in their cloud and on-premise systems and helping them uh, and their developers make, make sense of those different APIs. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to start today by talking about the proliferation and growth of APIs. Uh, talk about where we normally see APIs in the enterprises and the different types and how they compare, and then introduce a methodology about uh, the right approach, at least that we've seen, to organize these APIs and create a platform uh, for aiding in their discovery. So just to start off, I wanted to recapture, and I'm sure given that we're in a conference about APIs, uh, everybody here is well aware of some of these metrics, but wanted to just quickly recapture the way that APIs have proliferated over the past few years. to 15 years with multiple billion dollar companies created around the developing and serving these APIs uh, as products to developers. But on top of that, we've also seen a pretty large growth in the number of APIs found in uh, larger organizations that we have conducted earlier in the year and where we measured the number of APIs that we see in different companies based on their, uh, the sizes of those organizations. Uh, and what you see is clearly as organization scales, the number of APIs and services and microservices um, that they have scale. And we've seen these similar numbers across other services. This is actually some numbers from Imperva from 2018. You see similar distribution in terms of the scale and the number of APIs that companies are building. Um, so the factor to acknowledge is that developers are increasingly utilizing and building APIs in order to develop their applications. In terms of 50% of the organizations we're speaking about 300 or more APIs uh, that exist throughout the architecture. And in fact, uh, many, and, and we've worked with several of these, have thousands and thousands of APIs within the architecture. Um, and these are not just internal APIs, and this is something that I'll explain in a second. We're actually seeing those APIs oftentimes starting as internal services and microservices, but also then graduating to being partner-facing APIs and even public developer-facing APIs. So when we talk about APIs, we normally think about um, three kind of high-level schemes. So you think about the internal APIs, so these are the microservices services that are used to develop internal applications uh, and only consumed by internal developers. You have the partner APIs, so exposed ad hoc to customers or to partners that you have a direct relationship with, and then public APIs. Um, and we see that it's a continuous process, and I'm going to get to the types of APIs in a second, but just wanted to recapture that uh, because that does influence and think about APIs that are potentially going to graduate from being purely internal to then also being publicly facing should also influence the types of APIs that are being selected. So seeing this tremendous growth in the API space, uh, we don't, one of the things that we've been observing is not just the, um, the growth in the sheer number of APIs and services, but also the growth in the variety and versatility of those API types. So going into the different types of APIs, this is actually some data from the same uh, survey that we've conducted earlier in the year. Um, and it includes some other technologies, so not just strictly speaking API formats. But the reality that we've seen is it's not most companies don't just have one or two or three uh, different types of APIs they're leveraging, but are actually leveraging APIs across the board. So if you think about RESTful and SOAP based APIs, which are probably, um, as you can kind of see in the number here, in the numbers here, the most predominant types of APIs. But we're now seeing more a lot of reverse APIs, so webhooks, um, pub sub models, GraphQL based APIs, gRPC and RPC based uh, systems. So a lot of different types of APIs um, throughout the, the, the business architecture. And the goal that we have uh, in, the quote, in, in, in this talk today is just to make a bit of sense about all these different types. So, you know, one of the natural things that we've uh, gone and done as we started observing this landscape is just trying to organize those different APIs on a maturity scale. Uh, so going with the normal suspects of REST, uh, RESTful, REST-based APIs, which is probably the kind of de facto standards for what APIs should look like, at least where these have been for the past uh, few years. You also obviously have SOAP, which is uh, still predominantly found like the second most popular type of API that we see in production systems within the enterprise. Then you have the more, like the newer and more um, exotic types of APIs. So you think about GraphQL, uh, Kafka and generally speaking, Q and asynchronous APIs, uh, the concept of using webhooks, PubSub um, APIs, RPC, and uh, obviously the new generation GRPC. So, trying to just look at these APIs 
um, on more of the maturity or timeline. And I think that a lot of people, at least that we've been engaging with, have this notion of it's there's always going to be a best practice or a single type of API. Um, and over time, those are just going to shift. And we've seen some of that, like some types get replaced or um, shifted into newer, newer types and newer formats. But at the same time, we've also seen that as more of these types are being introduced, the more diversity you end up seeing uh, within enterprise architecture. And the reality of, of what's driving that is that APIs and microservices play a lot of different roles in applications. So sometimes you use an API to retrieve data, sometimes you use it to retrieve and edit and impact the data. Sometimes it's more around executing different jobs or tasks or encoding data, sending emails, processing payment, and or even converting between different uh, formats of data. So there are a lot of different roles that APIs play. And because of that, there are a lot of different requirements for these APIs. So sometimes you know that it's an API that's going to be used to explore um, and slice and dice data differently. So you want to give flexibility around that. Um, but some other times you may care about low, low latency because you're expecting requests to respond very quickly or because you're requesting a, uh, or expecting a huge volume of requests. So you want to make sure that there's no overhead. Sometimes you want to manage load uh, because you know that there are a lot of big tasks that are being executed. So the reality is because of the very nature of APIs, there isn't necessarily a one size fit all. And the newer approach that uh, we've seen is most companies actually maintaining technologies that they're acknowledging that they're going to have many different types of APIs. So this is the approach that we operate under. And then what I'd like to do is just introduce some of the most common types of APIs that we've been seeing um, and the use cases that um, call for, for, for leveraging those types of APIs. So the first type that I'm going to introduce um, it's probably the de facto API type that, that people think about when they think about APIs, uh, and that's a uh, REST-based API. Uh, so those are very common uh, and have a very clean model around editing and performing CRUD operation over data and treating it as object. I think that the biggest benefit, at least that I've seen with REST-based APIs, is how familiar um, developers are with them. And we've always seen them using interchangeably for the term HTTP just because how common this paradigm for designing APIs are. And many of the public APIs that we've seen actually rely on the REST full diagram or at least something that is similar to it. Um, the base of it is very simple, operating around uh, performing operations and objects. So you can put an object, you can get it, you can delete it, um, you can post to it and, and, and edit its data. Um, so what it gives is a very common, when, when you think about the context of editing um, and fetching data, so if you're editing and fetching tweets on Twitter API, or editing or fetching orders and then ordering an e-commerce API, it gives a very simplified um, and easy to understand paradigm around working with it. And then one of the other benefits that we've seen with it is you can work with JSON, XML, plain text, so it supports a lot of different data types. Um, and again, that's one of the things that have contributed to making it very popular. Now, another type that we've seen is this, again, the second most popular types of API, uh, type of API is, this, is so based API. So sim uh, simple logic protocol um, relies purely on XML uh, to make requests. And again, provides a very uh, set schema for editing, uh, retrieving and editing data uh, through that API, usually it's XML envelopes. Um, we've seen this as more as a bit of a legacy platform, almost so popular amongst a lot of uh, older or more mature APIs, uh, but still very predominant through a lot of enterprise uh, API or, or service uh, landscape. So I think that a lot of time, um, you know, we see an argument between REST uh, and SOAP and which format should be chosen. Um, I think that in today's day and age, um, and I'm kind of presenting it here together because I also think that in terms of functionally speaking, they're probably of the same like classic default de facto flavor of APIs you're going to see. Uh, I think that in today's day and age, REST is probably going to end up being the most predominant and the most frequently chosen type. Uh, but those are like the two basic uh, flavors of APIs um, to be familiar with. Now, from here, I'm going to venture into a bit of the newer or more unique types that we're seeing. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to talk about is GraphQL. Um, the reason for it is I think that it's becoming, uh, and we're seeing it becoming tremendously popular within a lot of architectures. We're actually using it ourselves in Rapid API. Uh, so when you actually go to rapidapi.com, the entire platform is based on a GraphQL API. Uh, 
Um, so we have a lot of experience with it. And what's really unique about GraphQL is the ability to query pretty complex data, uh, data um, models with very simple and singular queries. So the goal is if you think about a REST or a SOAP-based API, you normally go and fetch a single piece of data at a time. And every time you fetch it, you get the entire piece of data, even if you only need parts of it. The way that GraphQL works is it gives you different data types, and you can basically build a query that fetches data from that entire um, data tree or data graph uh, that you're accessing. So for instance, if you get data about a company, you can then also get its founders and its investor and basically build out the whole graph. So the nice thing is you don't need to make multiple requests. You can make one and get all the data that you need, uh, but you also can only select the parts of the data. So if you get the data about a company, maybe you want its name, its address, and uh, country that it, uh, countries that it operates in, but you don't actually need a bunch of other data about when it was founded and the history of the company. So you can select which parts of the data you need and which types you omit. So I think that the, the use cases that we've seen is popular for GraphQL are you know, obviously, it's, or, or the reasons that we've seen people going to use it is easy. It's pretty easy to use and a very easy transition from using RESTful and other HTTP based APIs. Um, it can actually increase performance when querying complex data types uh, just by building those complex queries and needing uh, data that you don't, don't need in a request. Um, it actually introduces a lot of development efficiencies by decoupling the front end and the back end of the application. So you don't actually have to worry about a lot of things like versioning or adding or removing data because the front end defines what it needs and the back end defines what it offers, and it doesn't have to be a full one-to-one -one match. And another thing that I've really liked about it is it makes it very easy to onboard new developers into using it. And the reason is by the way you build GraphQL, schemas and, and types are an embedded part of it. Um, so it means that you're basically documenting the APIs as you build them. So it lends itself to really nice easy to learn uh, APIs. So that's GraphQL. And then the last site that I'm going to really shine a spotlight on um, is the idea of Kafka-based APIs. And I'm going to talk specifically about that technology. Um, but I want to also emphasize that it extends itself to the broader paradigm of asynchronous APIs or queue-based APIs. And the concept there is basically using a queue of operation um, to move requests or to move uh, operations from one service to another. Uh, so you can create tasks or jobs, um, put them into a queue, and allow others to consume them. So if you think about a very simple use case of that, you'd maybe have a web client for a video sharing service. So from the web client, somebody would upload a video, but then you need to encode that video. So it would push a request or an operation uh, to encode that video into a queue. And then on its own time, a separate encoding service can pull that request and process it. Now, at the same time that it's processing it, the client can keep pushing more requests. And this is one of the beautiful things about this format. And they sit in the queue, so you don't have to worry about the demand being met between all the different services at the same time. You can kind of scale them independently. And then similarly, the encoding service can finish, push another message to the queue, and the web client can use it at its own time to kind of update the UI or something. So the main use cases for using those type of asynchronous APIs or when you have a lot of processing that can happen asynchronously, uh, and you want to um, make sure that some services can scale up and down, but you don't necessarily need to account for uh, spikes in traffic um, all across the platform. Um, so again, really easy scaling. And in general, when a big data processing or big data jobs um, are encountered. Now, a few other types of APIs that I touched on earlier uh, that we've seen as popular the concept of webhooks, and again, this is not necessarily a type of APIs because those webhooks can be so pressed or other types um, of endpoints. But basically, the idea of incoming APIs when it's not just the developer calling the API, but also the API calling the, the developer or the client back. Um, so it allows for more of those real time events and, and, and triggering different applications. Uh, another one that we've seen that offers a different solution to some of the similar problems is the idea of sub. Of sub uh, so sockets or other types of communications where messages can be sent both ways. Um, and in general, a big world around RPC, gRPC, and other uh, ways, and, and other flavors. Um, so the idea of remote uh, process calling um, and being able to trigger um, processes uh, or procedures in other machines through those uh, APIs. And we have seen gRPC, especially where low latency um, and low overhead is required, starting to gain a lot of traffic. 
uh, and popularity within our um, customer base. So I wanted to kind of summarize that and again pull out the fact that one of the things that we've been seeing is beyond just the need uh, to choose the right, it's not really about choosing the right type of API, and in that, in, in that sense, the topic of this conversation may be a little misguided. It's about acknowledging that every API may end up having a different type. Um, and more and more, we see organizations and architectures facing a more heterogeneous environment. So if you think about it, even from an infrastructure perspective, you have some APIs and services that are running on-premise, some APIs and services are running in the cloud, and then also consuming a bunch of APIs that are third parties. And then those APIs, again, in those kind of three general areas, end up having a bunch of different flavors and types. Um, and some of the architectural decisions um, and the DevOps decisions around it need to account um, for that um, variety in the types of services and the uh, number of services that are being used. And this is where we see the need to basically establish a hub or a catalog where all of these APIs can go and live regardless of the types uh, of, of the types um, and flavor of the APIs and regardless of the infrastructure and where they're actually running. So I'm going to talk for a second about, uh, and I know that I uh, only had a couple of minutes left for this conversation, but I'm going to quickly introduce the idea of that API hub or API platform uh, that we see growing within enterprise architecture. Um, and again, this is acknowledging the fact that uh, a lot of companies are going towards microservices. I sh I've shown some of the numbers earlier around the number of APIs uh, that we see within enterprises. Um, and those APIs are becoming increasingly important. I'm just skipping ahead here a little bit. Um, to unlocking innovation and easing development within the organization. So what we've seen companies doing is, again, acknowledging they're going to have hundreds of APIs spread across the cloud, some on-premise systems, um, and then third-party APIs that they're consuming with many different flavors, creating that centralized platform or that centralized hub that developers from the one hand can publish and share APIs using, using it, and from the other hand, that engineering teams can refer to to discover and consume those APIs. So we think about it as that central enterprise hub uh, or enterprise API platform, where the API creators, again, can go to publish the APIs. The internal developers use that platform to discover and connect to those APIs within the organization, while at the same time, the external, external developers, so either partners, customers, clients, uh, can also be invited to that platform and gain access to certain APIs. Um, and the governance team can refer to that enterprise platform to discover and convert, to discover and understand who's using APIs within the organization and how they're being uh, consumed. Um, so from a publishing perspective, you know, some of the core capabilities that we're seeing is just think about things like, sorry, not sure what I'm doing wrong here, but uh, publishing API document, being able to publish API documentation, integrating with the CICD um, is process as well as the gateway of these APIs. Um, to be able to connect all the way through to the runtime with them, being able to access um, or to control the access and visibility of these APIs when publishing an API into the hub, who can control it and uh, how they can do so. Um, being able to support, and again, this very much relates to this conversation, all the different types of APIs, um, acknowledging that the enterprise is going to have multiple flavors, uh, and being able to easily monetize those APIs, especially if they start getting exposed to external partners. On more of the discovery and consumption piece, um, I think that the most critical or the basic functionality is just powering API search um, and allowing developers to easily search and discover those APIs. And from there, uh, and again, tagging and filtering to support that, allowing developers to easily uh, test and experience those APIs, generate code snippets to integrate them, um, and then monitor and analyze these um, APIs easily. So again, kind of zooming out here, um, we see this as becoming a very critical platform for both people creating and maintaining microservices in the organization um, and consuming them to be able to collaborate in APIs. And then just to very quickly touch in the last kind of like 90 seconds of this talk about Rapid API and what we do. So we are that platform, that API hub or API catalog within the organization uh, that connects the API producers and the API consumers. So powering the API economy by allowing developers to easily discover all the different APIs within the organization, uh, easily connect to them um, and integrate them into the applications, and then be able to monitor and analyze the APIs too. And one of the things that we've emphasized here at Rapid is being able to, or being built for that next generation 
of APIs where there are a lot of different flavors and types of APIs within the architecture. So think about REST, so Kafka, string-based APIs, uh, asynchronous APIs, and so forth. And supporting all of them as first-class citizens on the platform. So if you think about you know, the re way REST and SOAP APIs are supported and get this native look and feel in the platform. So replicating that also with GraphQL APIs and giving them a first-class citizen and a very native feel within the platform. Um, and then even things like Kafka and other exotic types of APIs. Um, so this, this is where the Rabbit API platform fits into that. Um, and I know this has been a very brief kind of introduction uh, to it, but I also just wanted to call out that if after this call conversation, you have any questions about the platform or in general, any thoughts or conversation or questions around the different flavors of APIs and how they fit into your architecture, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're always happy to talk about that. And then my personal contact is Edo, so IDO at rapidapi.com, and feel free to send me a message or inquiries about that at any time. All right. Thank you very much for, for the talk. It was very interesting to see the APIs. Uh, we're actually very good in time. There is no question for you here in the chat, but you know everybody that is interested that you know that everybody can reach out to you um, in person if in like virtually if they want. So we're gonna now you can stop sharing your screen. We can leave the channel. We are very good in time. So we can now take a break of 20 minutes and we will be back with the sessions in uh, in uh, noon 20. I'll see you later, guys. <laughs>